self quarantining. And a quarantine order. Quarantined in their Held in quarantine. Quarantine. The quarantine in place. Or quarantine for the required 14 days. Hey, what's up, guys? Welcome to another episode of Quarantine Talks. This is me, JC, your host. And today I got a very special guest for you guys. Three-time Grammy Award winning super producer, Troy Taylor. He's been in the business for over 30 years and has worked with everyone from Aretha Franklin to Jacquees. All right. He's had a hand in forming boys to men, Tyrese, and is the person who, ladies, you guys or well, you ladies, or a very big thank you to because he is the person that found and mentored the talent that we now know to be Trey Songs. All right, so this interview today is going to be split into two parts. Part one is gonna discuss who Troy Taylor is and the things that he's done in the business. Uh, we're gonna discuss and talk over his mayor of R&B campaign where he's bridging the gap between old style R&B and the new styles. Uh, working with the newer acts like YK Osiris and Jacquees. Um, of course, him mentoring and founding Trey Songs. And then for the industry heads, yo, we got deep into record industry splits, aka how to secure your bag in the studio. We went deep into that. I did that just for the industry heads here. And then unexpected connection between JC, Trey Taylor, and Trey Songs. So you guys don't want to miss this episode. We're about to get into it. Let's go. Yay, yay. I don't know why. <laughs> and ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to another episode of Quarantine Talks. This is going to be our Global Talks edition. And today uh, I got with me virtually, of course, because uh, you know Corona, uh, the legend, <laughs> the legend, the myth, that guy, Troy Taylor. So, Mr. Am Taylor. I a myth? Uh, well, uh, not a myth. I don't think I'm a myth. Not a myth. Not a myth. Not a myth. Bad word. But, like, <laughs> definitely a legend, though. Definitely a legend. Well, I appreciate that. Um, so, first, I know who you are. Um, but if there's anyone that doesn't know who you are, I want to ask. Um, obviously, we know your name. But, like, where you're from, um, what you do, and how long you've been in music. Um... I am from New Haven, Connecticut. I've been doing music this year for 30 years. Um, so this is my 30th anniversary. Congrats. <laughs> February 11, wasn't it? Yes, it's, yes, sir. Uh, 2020. <laughs> 2020 is going to end up being great. I just know I know that it's going to end up being great, so I'm not going to trip. Okay. How did you get started in the biz? Well, I was an artist first, and then um, upon... Uh, working on my album for that independent label that I signed to, I also met Timmy Registered, who was at Motown Records, and then he and I built a relationship, and then he ended up buying me off that label, um, signing me to Motown, so I became a Motown artist. Um, and then upon working with a few groups uh, on Motown, and one being boys to men in the middle of working on that particular beginning album coolie high harmony uh when they came out and blew up i decided i didn't want to be an artist because i realized that i could do everything i want to do without having to be the front man so i was like i'd rather do that and so i told timmy register and i told gerald busby who was the president at the time that i didn't want to i didn't want to come out and they they honored it I wanted to be like a singer. That didn't work out. So I was like, let me be a songwriter. That that, that lane was more my thing because the first time I had to be in a booth and mm-hmm. sing a harmony 20 times until I got it right, I was like, this isn't for me. So uh, <laughs> this is not uh, what I, this is not what I want to do. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so um, for Quarantine Talks, all right, um, the basis of it is it came about as I am home now as a lot of us are home and uh, Mm -hmm. I was just bored in my house and I heard this quote that said uh, creative people are going to get creative Mm -hmm. Um, so I already have a visual medium which is the OVT network which is where we do interviews uh, things like that so speaking about corona and COVID-19 I want to know how is this affecting your life like what's your daily routine now is there anything you've had to like cancel or postpone um 
um, you know, like, what are you doing to manage yourself? And first and foremost, um, my mom is good. My brother's good. My son's good. Uh, my son is 20. He's in Oklahoma with his mom. So okay. he's good. My mom will be 75 April 5th. Oh, wow. Uh, Oh, wow. Her birthday is right around the corner. Yeah. She's um, in New Haven still, and my brother's there with her. He's my older brother. Um, So they're good. Now, Troy Taylor, all I do (laughs) is make music in the house. I don't go anywhere if I don't have to. I do travel, but I haven't traveled in a while because I didn't have to. Um... Since I got a dog, it kind of like restricted me because, you know, I didn't really, haven't found a good care, dog care. Like a good dog sitter? Yeah. Okay. So I just haven't really pushed to go anywhere. So this is my norm. Okay. So when they said quarantine. You was like, oh, I do that anyway. I do that anyway. Mm. Literally. <laughs> so it has not changed anything for me. Mm. Uh, tell us about this campaign that you're on. So the so the mayor of R and B campaign is a, is a campaign that I created uh, to dedicate myself a little bit more, even though I've been doing it for years anyway. But to to kind of like put a title on me acclimating myself into today's uh, generation of R and B, and to uh, dedicate my time and 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 my my creativity to helping the kids understand that you know you still can do arrangements. You still can do bridges. You still could put changes in your music and it not be too complicated. Most of them don't know how to do it. That's why they don't do it. It's not that they don't want to do it. They still listen to the 90s. And if you're still listening to the 90s, the changes are there. However, most of them can't play keys. Right. They just fruity loops click in the notes and all of that stuff. Mm. So they don't know how to you know, arrange most of them. And so they don't. And so what tends to happen is they start making hits without it. And so it starts making it believe that, um, you don't need it. Right. And that's not true because again, they're still listening to the, uh, the, the the nineties and they're still sampling nineties music. So as long as they're still sampling nineties music, that lets me know they wish they could do it, but they don't. So they'll either sample it or whatever. So for me, you know, my generation is angry anyway because they they feel ah oh, this ain't this ain't no R and B and uh so it's like I'm not that person. I'm the one that will understand where the generation is now and go okay, this is what you guys are doing. All right, well why don't you just add this right here? Right. And oh 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 yeah, how you do yeah. that? <laughs> yeah, exactly. How you do so, that? So you know. I, I I I definitely dedicate my time to make sure that you know and I work with a lot of young up and coming producers. Um, I'll take their tracks and then I'll embellish it on it and embellish on it and 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 show them what else you can do with it. And once they hear it, it's like, yo, that's crazy, yo, yo, yeah, I wanted to change right there. <laughs> well, I get it. I understand. You're putting yourself kind of as like the middleman, the bridge in between the new and the old. Yes. Gotcha. Because I, I feel that too. Like I'm I'm in this weird place. Uh, I just made 32 this year. So uh-huh. it's like when I listen to music now, it's like, okay, I can't stand this shit at all. Like I don't yeah. want to, I can only you're, do you're growing up. Yeah. Like, yeah. And, and it's something I, I think uh, one of my buddies, Kent, uh, he's got another podcast. Uh, he's the creator of Black and Abroad. Me and him were talking about it. And he was like, um, at a certain point, musically, you stop growing. Like, I think it's like maybe 32, 35 in that area. Like, you start realizing, like, what your musical niche is and, like, what you like and what you don't like. You don't start listening to any more music. And it's like, this new stuff, man, like, I can't. It's very hard. Like, and I'm not that old. But I grew up in, like, the golden age of 90s R&B. So it's like, I know what real music sounds like. And this yes. ain't it. Um, mm-hmm. How did you start working with uh, YK and Jacquees? How did that come about? So um, I met 
a gentleman by the name of King Tut. Okay. And King Tut is a uh, um, new new Jacquees and put me in contact with Jacquees and kind of put us together. Um, uh, Breland, one of my writer slash artist proteges, um, met Osiris because Chris Brown posted one of his vocal uh, posts. Okay. And Chris Brown don't normally do that. So when he posts Breland's uh, thing, I think it, uh, you know, drew, drew a lot of attention to him and Osiris hit him up. And um, so they built a relationship and then Breland brought him to me. Okay. And uh, wait, just to backtrack a little bit, Breland is whom? Breland is, um, he's he's called the Pinpoint Guard. I gave him a name called the Pinpoint Guard. He's one of my protege writers. Uh, but he also just released a song called My Truck okay. that went super viral. And so... The country uh, trap thing, right? Like the country, yes. yeah, I got you, got you, got you. Okay. So I co-produced that with uh, Cal and it just took off. And then, you know, the label started hitting him up and now he signed to Atlantic. But yeah, he was the one that brought Osiris to me. Okay, cool. Who, uh, out of the two, I want to know, um, who's easier to work with and why? Out of who? Uh, let's say uh, YK Osiris and Jacquees. Okay, they're, you know, they're, they're, their age makes a difference because okay. I was, uh, Jacquees is older and more and more seasoned and more mature. Right. Um, so Jacquees is easier. Uh, YK is hyper. And young. <laughs> the look on your face right now. <laughs> you look like a dad. Like you <laughs> like that's your child. Like you're like, oh God, son, can we just yeah. can we yeah. just <laughs> so keeping his attention and trying to keep him focused is you know, wasn't easy. But he you know, there was this level of respect so that um I would I would get what I needed done, but for the most part, when we would work, you know, him and Breland would, you know, work together down in the studio. I would come down and polish it up. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. So, YK is more Breeze, more Breeze protege, and then Jacquees is more someone that you have more hands-on experience with. Yes. And you think and that's simply because of age and just generational differences? Yes. And just, yes. Definitely gotcha. the age. Mm -hmm. Got you, got you, got you. Um, which aspect do you like more, writing or production and composition? Um, I don't write as much as I used to, lyric melody wise. I do when I when I work with Trey. I, I definitely do it then, but I don't do it as much. I do mentor and, and build more young writers coming up and have them do it. So I'm gonna say production still. Can we talk about? how you came to work with Trey Songs and um, just like your relationship thus far? Uh, back in the day, uh, a friend of mine, well, my partner at the time, he went to high school some years back with uh, Trey's stepdad. And so Trey's stepdad, you know, knew that uh, my partner was in, you know, doing music now and, and, the, and the music producer. So he asked him if he could listen to his stepson and my ex-partner was more so the business side. I was the music side. So he asked me if I could meet with Kenny's uh, son and just critique him, give my opinion, and then let Kenny know so that Kenny could kind of like get off his back. So <laughs> I have Trey, you know, have the kid come over and, you know, just thinking that I'm going to listen to him sing and talk to him for me, you know, a little bit and then send him on his way. Right. Um, it didn't quite happen that way, that simple, because once he sang, it was like nothing that blew me away, but it was enough to hear his tone and then see it in his eyes. He was not a bad looking kid, you know, big head, plaques coming out of his <laughs> shorts. Um, but yet in his face, there was something in his face that you could see. Um, and so I, he, he sang a song, Donnell Jones, Where I Want to Be. And then he sang a song that um, he, he, a song that he wrote. And he had already been rapping before that. Right. And so it was like, he sings a lot too. So it was like, which direction should I go in? 
And so... Um, At the time, like, I'm guessing he was a better singer than a rapper, or is it, was it kind of even? You just, no, you just saw Trey, him? Let me tell you, Trey's one of the coldest rappers. Okay. Period. Um, I think he had more of a love. He had love for both, but I think he wanted to pursue, you know, singing as well. And so I put a track to the song that he wrote and, you know, taught him how to do the demo I guided him through it and when once he heard himself that was it because that was his first time recording once he heard himself recording you know singing that, that you know that, that stuff is a drug anyway singing is a drug yeah. uh, the artistry music is a drug yeah and once he got a hold of that that was it so when did you guys actually move the whole operation down to atlanta like when did you establish roots in the a um we did trade day in atlanta okay that's where it began so Trey, Trey uh, lived here. I still lived in Texas because I was married at the time. Okay. Um, so I would come here to work on the album. Um, the third album, which is the Ready album, uh, Trey had moved to Atlanta. Because okay. he still hadn't moved here yet. And so he moved here. And as I was going through my divorce, I lived in Texas. As I was going through my divorce, I would come here. And then I just stayed here as I was going through my divorce. Because mm-hmm. uh, funny backstory behind that so like uh my my then roommate one of my best friends now but any music that you hear inside of any of my shows he's actually the one that makes it okay. and so at the time i don't know if you remember this or not but like he had a studio session session set up with trey at the house in douglasville and i think i think you were there too and uh he actually never made it to that session because his car blew up <laughs> like on the highway like actual Ooh. explosion on 20 um mm. and i just was like it kind of comes full circle like when i'm thinking about this car explosion six years ago to now i'm just like wow like I- that's that's kind of like uh it's interesting like how yeah. life happens like that i was like wow like yeah i was like i'm definitely gonna tell him about this uh because <laughs> <laughs> i know you probably don't remember him his name I is brian <laughs> now That's you know <laughs> and so my next question is for all of the industry heads and all of the people that are working in music and want to uh just be financially sound and sane in music You've been in the game basically as long as I've been alive, so I know you know. Um, how do you avoid issues with splits and and all of those things to make sure like things go smoothly financially from the business aspect of music? Well, first of all, you can't be afraid to bring up the splits after you finish the song. Okay. A lot of people feel like, ooh, that's taboo. Nah, it ain't taboo. It's the pr- proper time where everybody remembers the exact lyrics that they did. Um, and the melodies that they did. Um, but you have to be forthgiving. You know, you have to come and be like, hey, so, hey, like, let's, 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 you know, let's sit down and figure out who gets what. Okay. That's the perfect time because there's nothing done with that song. Um, and it's the, the slate is clean. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Cause you did that part with the bridge, but the woo. Yeah, yeah. You did the B section. Right, right, right. And then you decide on who gets what. Um, either you split it evenly, um, which to me is the best thing to do if it's somebody who you know that you can continue on writing with. But if it was somebody in the room that wasn't necessarily a part of the main clique and they inputted some things, you probably say, you know, are you going to write with that person again? Maybe you will, maybe you won't, but it's not the main person you write with. You determine what that person should get. Once they agree, at that moment after everybody agrees, you then get their emails and you put down in the email what you just agreed on, email it to each other. Everybody has to reply, agreed, 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 agreed. What happens is clockwork, guaranteed. Everybody forgets. Um, everybody for, is like forgets quotation marks or actually no, forgets. Everybody forgets okay. what they agreed to. Ah, okay. Everybody forgets, <laughs> especially when something happens with the song. Okay, I'll do best case scenario. Chris Brown wants to take the song. Everybody, this is weeks later. Everybody's excited. Let's take it even a step further. Chris Brown's vocals is on it. 
Mm. He, 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 he goes on IG and plays a snippet of it. Mm -hmm. Everybody's going crazy. Mm -hmm. Watch me. Yo, so what what was what did we what what did we agree on the splits for what was like, the splits again like wait wait because you know I, I wrote the bridge so you know like the bridge is that's the part he played on the ig so you know like that's the you know that because you know like, i feel you <laughs> check the email yo i know i said 10 percent, but yo shouldn't it be 15 clockwork mm -hmm. this is a clockwork thing that happens mm -hmm. dude you agreed to 10 percent. i know that but like I was talking to somebody and it was like saying if it's the if I like did the melody and the lyrics, I should have gotten this, this, that, and the third. Nigga, you agree <laughs> to ten percent. We are not changing it. Stop it. Yo, I'm just saying, man, I should have got more. Niggas will forget. Even though it clearly says what they agreed to. Okay, so now like using the email method that you just did, okay, so what happens in a situation where like like I, I typed 10 but I meant 15 like how do you deal with that situation moving forward you stay strong on it okay let's say um, they let's say they get to really you know that they want to get your attorneys involved and all that right you simply send back that email to the attorney the attorney will clearly see that you agreed ain't really much can do be happen right now okay after that, you know, they could be mad at you. They could go talk about you, what they normally do. Yo, this nigga, you know, I should have gotten wiki boo, blah, blah, blah. They could spread all of that they want to. But if anybody steps to you and says, yo, I heard that you did it, did it, da, Yeah, I heard that he agreed to 10. I got it in the email. Because mm -hmm. uh, another one of my friends um, worked inside of the music space as well. And he was telling me, like, it's something like $1.5 billion dollars in unclaimed royalty and like something like 70 percent of it is urban music urban aka black and so you know it's like one of those things where it's 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 these issues with the splits happen because yeah. and you know and the thing about it is i don't know you know a lot of listeners may not know this because i don't know how how deep involved in music but i know the industry heads are gonna know like when you don't agree on the split no one gets that money like that money yeah, like holds it up it holds it up. It holds it up. Like, I know personally songs that have number one hits. Ain't nobody got paid out on that. Like, you might... Yeah. The, the artist himself might make a performance royalty from it. But, like, mm -hmm. the the actual lion's share of the money is still mm -hmm. being held in Interscope's bank somewhere or Atlantic's bank somewhere, and they're accruing interest yeah. on it. And it's, like, one of those things where it's, like, it's, it's a really big issue. Like I said, that's 1.7 or so yeah. billion, almost $2 billion in unclaimed musical royalties that yeah. you know if we look at 70 percent of urban music production who makes urban music like that money you know black people brown people people of color like that's money that's needed yeah. and you know it happens because we can't agree or we don't agree or find some method of agreement for the splits so that way in your situation like you said happened oh it, w it was cool in the studio and we all verbally said okay we're gonna do 25 25 25 but now that rihanna's on it it's like oh yeah yeah no 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 i mean i i but i did the melody and the but you didn't do you know and these issues hold up money so i'm like i, I want to ask an industry vet, like, how do we alleviate this moving forward? Like, how do you make sure things are the way that they are supposed to be? So, yeah, you just get everybody to agree. Once you got that email, once everybody replies to that email, that's it. They can go back and forth, go back and forth, go back and forth, go back and forth, but that will hold up in a court of law. Okay, that's what's up. I, li I like that. Like, that's a very good idea. So, I mean, y'all heard it, man. Like, emails, paper, something that everybody can agree on it and hold up in a quarter lobby like, look, you agree No, because once it came amount. from your email, came, ain't nobody frauding that. I ain't nobody changing it. Your, yeah, you, right. yeah, you, can't, you can't lie and say, oh, you, you, that was a fraud. You know, because, you know, getting people to sign a lyric sheet, a, a split sheet, could be a little bit hard because people can always stall. And they can just be stalling out to see what happens, right? I say to do the quickest and easiest thing. Yo, y'all, I'm going to send it to your email. Um, just, you know, reply back, agree. And that's it for part one, guys. Make sure you subscribe and then keep an eye locked to your podcast and IG feeds for part two, dropping this Saturday at April 11th, 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Oh, and before I forget, every episode of the podcast is now available on YouTube. So if you want to take a listen to it on your computer, on YouTube, you can do that. Go.
right now. Bye. <laughs> All right. Well, that's it, guys. Thanks for listening. Hope you guys enjoyed the convo. And if you would like to be a guest on the show or you know anybody who might want to be on the show, who might make a good guest, please shoot an email over to jc at the ovt.com. Again, that's the letters J C at the T-H-E O-V-T O-V-T dot com. Also, don't forget to like, comment, subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Anchor. Quarantine Talks is edited and produced by me, JC, with music by Brian Haddon. Thanks so much, guys, for listening. Stay safe, stay sane, and stay creative. All right? Peace.